Welcome to the Personal Podcast, the podcast where we get to meet the real person behind the professional. I am delighted today to be joined by Gemma Holmes, who's Business Development Manager at Talent Heads. Gemma, how does it feel when your intestines fall out? Um, <laughs> best way to describe it, uh, I feel like you're dying. Um, it's it's a long time ago, it's over 10 years ago, so um, from what I remember, I can just remember um, this, it's a really weird way to explain it and I don't really know how to explain it, but it almost feels like this unraveling, unraveling feeling, so it's like this jelly or wobbling and it just keeps unraveling and unraveling. Thankfully, I didn't actually look down when it was happening, although now I wish I'd got a photo so I could actually see what it looked like. Um, but it just felt like this thing was just unraveling and, and getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and then all of a sudden I can, I, 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 it felt like, um, this really burning, stinging sensation as though it hit the fresh air and it just felt, it was the most bizarre feeling ever. My goodness. Um, how did this even come about? So I'd had Theo, um, and I'd had a C-section and like hospitals, um, they're always trying to get you out of hospital. They'd always tr they're trying to rush you to get out of hospital. Um, and I can remember, um, I can remember they were saying to me, um, come on, come on, you've got to get up, you've got to get up, walk about, walk about, we've got to get you home today. And I said, oh, I can't get up, it, feel, it doesn't feel right, it feels strange. So they said, I got up to go to the toilet and I felt like it was something bulging out my, st out my tummy. Um, and then I, went to the toilet and then I felt like something pop inside, like long melt of my C-section line. Um, so I went back to the bed and as I went back to the bed, as I laid down, my wound just split open. And then then everything started unraveling from there. Um, and at that point, I was in a ward full of other mums that just had babies and um, I would just shout, I can remember just shouting help. Um, my insides had fell out. And God knows what the mums would have thought at the time because they were sat with their babies as well. And the nurses ran in. Um, I can remember them all rushing around me. Theo was laid in his little incubator. Um, and I, the first thing that I did was rang my mum um, because I was supposed to be going home that day. And she soon she answered the phone and I just said, Mum, my insides have fallen out. And she was just like, what? So she was like, oh my God, where's the nurses? Where's the nurses? Have you told someone? I said, yeah, I've told someone. Um... So then um, someone came in. I didn't even look. I think at that point I'd kind of just, it felt like I was there but wasn't there. Um, and they put a call, it, what it was, I think it was something wet. They just placed something over my intestines and um, then said, come on, we have to get you back down to theatre um, and then rushed me to theatre. And then then I was just out straight away. Um, so, yeah. I just can't imagine how the red the stop was. <laughs> and um, how did you not pass out? I don't know whether I did pass out or not. All I can remember is making these really weird hyperventilating breathing noises when I was right. getting rushed down through the corridors. I couldn't see anyone. I couldn't take any notice of anybody um, whilst I was on the bed getting run running down the corridor with me. And at that point, I suppose, I couldn't even think about what was even going to happen. I, I was more worried about who was with Theo and what was going to happen with Theo. At that time, um, you don't even have time to think. I was just straight back into theatre. and um, But I, I kind of felt like I was in my body, but not in my body, if you know what I mean. Yes, and, and yeah, it's, it, we need to remember you just had a baby as well. You have a newborn baby that you're meant to be caring for, but all of a sudden your insides are falling out. Yeah, <laughs> you rushed it. When I tell people now, they're like, "Oh my god!" I don't know how. You I don't work. tell anyone that who's just about to have a baby. Don't <laughs> mind you. I don't. I mentioned that after they've had it. Once they've had it, yeah. Surely this must be quite a rare occurrence, though. Well, you think so? Yeah. I mean, I've never heard anyone else that have ever had the inter the insides fall out. So, which uh, which hopefully is just a very rare occasion. How long were you in surgery for? I don't even know. I think I when I'd come out, um, they sutured up. Um, and used di um, different type of stitches. Um, so, sorry. Um, so when I came out, I came out um, after the theatre, <laughs> um, and then I was in I was in a different ward in a room on my own um, for probably about another three or four days because I refused to get up and walk. I didn't want to get out of bed because it was going to happen again. And the nurses were like, 
they had the counselling team come and see me and they said, you know, it's not going to happen again. That was a really rare occasion. It, we've never seen anything like that this before. Um, so they reassured me and said that it was very, very rare for this to happen. They're not too sure why. So, yeah, because there's the physical trauma, but I can imagine psychologically, mm. I would be so scared of that happening, even like months afterwards. Yeah. Do you still ever worry? Didn't want to move. Sometimes I, I think, oh God, I can feel my scar. My scar's still sore. Um, and it's quite sensitive still. So, and that's like 10, nearly 11 years down the line. Um, I mean, I don't have the same worry and concern as I had then. Um, hopefully, you know, it's not going to fall out again or my intestines. But it's that it's that anxiety after having a baby, looking after your child, but then scared of getting up and scared of moving around in case it's it's going to happen again. Yeah, because when you've got a newborn baby back at home, it's really hard anyway. But mm-hmm. you've had not just a C-section to recover from, but then also there. Mm-hmm. How did you cope? Uh, I found it very difficult because obviously I had Ava at home as well. Ava was, uh, she was two, three when I, when I had Theo. Um, so I went home and, um, yeah, just mentally. And after that, I had, um, I had quite bad postnatal depression after as well. Um, because it was that worry of, you know, of what I'd just been through. It didn't actually hit me straight away. Actually, it actually took me a month or a couple of months to actually realise what had actually happened to me. And yeah. to kind of take that all in, um, and then had a had a bit of counselling from the hospital, and um, they came to see me at home, um, and then obviously I, after that I went to go and see um, a psychologist, so um, to have I suppose to understand why it happened and how you get over something mm-hmm. like that as well. Yeah, and I'd be worried like did they put them back in the right order? You know how it's all. Well, I do have some worrying thing is the is the is do they just shove them in yeah and just stitch you back up and just send you off you on your way um so touch wood i haven't had any other complications so yeah okay, yeah and then i would wonder like, if you had another baby would it open up again and we yeah thankfully i haven't had to experience that yeah. so, <laughs> i think it put me off for life after yeah having theo and um theo was a bit of a difficult child anyway so that took that decision away from me so yeah okay um, and what do you think about, because obviously the nurse has said to you in the first instance, you're okay, get up, you know, get on with your life. Um, do you think that women are treated with enough respect in kind of labour and during the birth process? No, not really. I think I, I think it's a very rushed process. I think yeah. a lot of women are just expected to get up, you've had a baby, get on with it and just, and you know, some, some people can. Mm. Um, but other people it takes a little bit longer to adapt to being a mum. You've got hormones flying all over and... You know, you've got your, your this little child to look after, and it's quite a scary thing. And when you're in a hospital, some people feel a little bit safer because it's you, you've got other people around you to support you. And when you go home, you're on your own, especially when if something like this happens or you have difficulties in hospital. Um, I think that it's there could be a lot more support for for women that have had babies. Yeah, yeah, I agree, and I, I, it depends on the different nurses you get because mm. I've had some that are lovely, but then some of that are just like, right, get up, get out. Yeah, literally they like the bad, so get up. Yeah, when you've <laughs> almost just had so much blood loss and you've yeah. had a catheter, they're like, right, get in the shower. Like, well, I'm attached to everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's really interesting. You understand the pressure that they're under. Yeah, as a woman in labour who needs to get in that bed that you're in now, but you do feel like you're on a conveyor belt sometimes. You do, but equally. Do you get compared to a lot of other countries at a high standard of care? And yeah, that's what I'm saying. There is other, obviously, other countries that don't have that. They do have to just get on, and they've had a baby, and life goes on, and it's that kind of thing. But I think that you know, ultimately, the there could be, and like you say, it depends on who you have to look after you and how your mm-hmm. care is and your care plan and things like that. So I think there's a it should be in on an individual basis, really, mm-hmm. to kind yeah. of what support you need. Yeah, definitely. And- Unfortunately, that wasn't the first instant you've had in hospital and you had, you experienced an anaphylactic shock. How did that feel? Yeah, so um, I always said I'd buy a house near a hospital because I think I spend a lot of my time at the hospital. <laughs> I can relate. Uh, yeah. I'm not quite as bad as you, but I'm sure, well, at one point they knew about my first name and the kids as well, so yeah. it's uh, quite fun. But um, so... This this day, I, it was to be fair. I was driving to work, um, and I'd bought um, what was it called? Um, a bag of mixed seeds. They weren't actually nuts, and I can't remember. It was the lady called Jillian. Oh, the Keith. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, so I bought. I was hungry, and I bought a bag of seeds, which I'd always had seeds in the past, like pumpkin seeds and sunflower seeds, and I ate them in the car. And I was driving to work, and I can remember. Um, 
getting out the car and then all of a sudden feeling like I've got chest pains and it felt like a little bit like indigestion. I was thinking, God, what's going on? I was walking to work and I was thinking like, these chest pains are really, really bad. Like, I don't know what's going on. So I walked into work, went in the office. I've always got bad sinuses anyway. And then I, my nose went really tingly and itchy and started getting blocked. And I was, and then my boss at the time said to me, um, have you got cold again? Because she's like, I'm, you're always ill. I was like, yeah, I know. <laughs> so I went into the toilets to have a look. And then I can remember my bottom lip went really hard. Mm. And I was thinking, oh, my God. And by the time I'd walked out of the toilet, she looked at me and she went, oh, my God. She said, have you, have you seen your face? I'll ring an ambulance. And within seconds, my lips were swollen. My face was swollen. My eyes, I couldn't see. I couldn't breathe. Um, and then I can't even remember anything else. So the ambulance came um, and then took me into, it was Huddersfield Hospital at the time, um, and went straight into um, intensive care. Well, uh, in the, the they were in the theatre first because they, they they kept I could hear lots of people talking around me saying that my lungs had collapsed or something had happened and they need to get me into theatre so I was just laid there thinking oh my god they're going to cut me off and now like and that's it um <clears throat> but I went into intensive care and then ended up staying in intensive care so it was all a bit of a blur um of kind of it just happened so fast mm, how long were you in intensive care in intensive care for probably for about a week and then I got I took out of intensive care to onto the normal wards after that. Goodness, and all because of you ate some seeds. Yes, but you normally could eat fine. I was eating, yeah, I used to eat them and they were nothing different. So when it came back, they did tests. They put it down as a nut allergy, but actually it's not a nut allergy because I can eat nuts and I was ate nuts when I came out of hospital. Um, but they did test and still to this day don't know what it was. That's even worse. Yes, because I've had a similar experience, but <laughs> it took a while, but they managed to pinpoint what it was in the mm -hmm. end. And since then, and cutting it out, you know, I've always got my EpiPen. I presume you've got one I've as well. Got as well yeah. um, I've managed it, but I, I did, I was a bit traumatized during that phase of not knowing what it was, of what I was eating. Mm -hmm. And just, again, like you, wanted to be near a hospital just in case it happened, mm -hmm. which is a little bit crazy. Yeah, it'd be life like that. Yeah. But um, for you ne not to know what it was. You no, know, and I think this is the problem now. So I carry my EpiPen with me, but I don't actually know what it was because it could have been anything. They said it could have been something that was manufactured in the packet or in production or something else could have been contaminated with with the packaging and uh, that, I've, that I've digested and they don't know what it is this day. And not long after that, I came out of hospital and I feel that I, sometimes I set myself into panic mode and then my, my throat would close up because yes. I thought I was having yeah an anaphylactic shock, but I actually wasn't. It was it was that I was I ate something and then panicked that it was it was that that was yeah. going to happen. Yeah, I've had that so, before as yeah. well. You just feel like that. You're just so worried. Mm. Yeah, it brings on the reaction. It does as well. Yeah. yeah. And, and have you ever had to use your EpiPen? Yes, I've used it a couple of times after okay. the hospital. Um, probably a few months after the hospital, I went out for a meal. And I think I was so nervous about eating foods because I didn't know what it was yeah. that actually I set myself into panic and ended up getting my pen and using my pen and then ended up going in the hospital with buying an ambulance because you have to, I, because you have to yeah. once you've used it. Um, that Thankfully, that's kind of tailed off a little bit now and I'm eating things now that... But I've always worried and I was conscious that if I go abroad or go away, that actually mm. is something else out there that I don't know that I'm allergic to, that I'm going to have that. Yeah, same. it's always a worry for me as well. And mm. most of my really bad reactions, I've only had one that was <laughs> really bad, mm -hmm. really, really bad. Um, it's abroad usually. And the yeah. thing that they told me is sometimes you can eat the same food in your home environment, but if you eat it where perhaps it's warmer than usual, mm. like often it is on holiday, or there's direct sunlight involved, mm -hmm. that can change how the food's absorbed for me my allergy was eventually pinpointed to it's wheat but exercise induced wheat anaphylaxis and so i was on a brisk walk at the time it wasn't even like i was running or anything but apparently the exercise changes the way that a certain protein is digested and that is what then triggered it so i wondered if for you it was not just that you were eating seeds but you were also walking a bit yeah, maybe. It's it's really bizarre and I still can't, to this day, still don't know if anyone, if I say to hospital now, I'm anaphylactic, they say, what to? I yeah. still put it down as nuts and seeds, but then I'll still have things with nuts and seeds on them, absolutely fine. But it's just, it's things like, um, so I can eat cooked carrot and I can't eat, I can eat cooked celery, but I can't eat raw carrot and I can't eat raw celery. This I still don't know why. But it's just, it's bizarre, yeah. And what sort of reaction does that trigger? It, my throat, so... Really, yeah. 
if anything's got like carrot in or juice or anything like that and it's got raw carrot in it automatically makes my throat really itchy and then I haven't actually tried to eat a full full carrot to see actually what would happen um because it's just the littlest bit would yeah. make my throat throat go crazy so um it's, crazy. it's the same with celery but I'm fine with it cooked so it's something to do with the way it's processed I think yeah. or something yeah, and I worry that my children might inherit my allergies. Do do you ever? Yeah, I think they've pretty much got majority of what I've got. <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> um, Ava's got asthma. I'm obviously a little boy. He's um, he's got eczema and and hay fever and all the other things that kind of go in line with with that. But yeah, I do often worry and think, you know, I'm not a f- picture of health really myself. So you do worry that your kids are going to kind of follow in suit. So I do try and try and limit certain things to see if I can help but I think if you if you're that way yeah and let's face it when you cut out all those allergen groups life's not that fun it's definitely not no <laughs> I often think about it yeah I often think about it and look and think mm, I wonder if I cut this this and this out and I did it once and it was the most yeah it was very very uh boring and you have withdrawal symptoms as well yeah when I first cut all gluten out I mm-hmm. felt horrific mm-hmm. proper mm-hmm. night sweats it was almost like I was coming off drugs yes <laughs> <laughs> Actually, a question I've always wondered: mm-hmm. <clears throat> Does putting the epipen in hurt? Uh, I don't think so. No, it goes into the it goes into really the muscle, hard. like the top of the leg. Yeah, and I always uh, what I'm probably you know I think one actually one person that I used to work with I uh, worked for um, once we were chatting about how we use the epipen and uh, she was like, oh, don't you just stab it in your heart or something? And I was like, that's like Pulp Fiction, isn't it? I was like. <laughs> You definitely do not do that. I was like, stay away from me and my EpiPen. <laughs> yeah, and I was a bit, a bit kind of cautious thinking, does actually anyone know how to use an EpiPen if anything happened? Um, so I do carry it. And um, the times I've used it, no, I think you you just, you just you're obviously the adrenaline's going, isn't it? So mm. at that point, it, you just you just use it. Yeah. When you're in that state, you yeah. don't care. You know, you're worried you're going to die. So yeah, I guess whatever. And do you feel that extra surge of adrenaline go through your body? Because already you feel so much adrenaline. What happens when you do you feel the adrenaline in the EpiPen? Go- yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think it just it, it all happens so quick. For me, the most um, the most scary thing is your throat closing yeah. up mm-hmm. um, and not being able to swallow yeah. or breathe. Um, and I think you go into panic anyway when that when that happens. Yeah, um, and it's the same with asthma. You know, when you have an asthma attack, it's like being able to not be able to breathe is is a, is a really scary feeling absolutely so, yeah you take it so much for granted mm-hmm. you, you you can just breathe yeah definitely yeah and for me as well it was um when <clears throat> things just started going black you started to go dizzy because you're just wondering will i wake up again you yeah. know in in that scary yeah yeah, yeah. You're, it's out of your control because you can't actually do anything you're just waiting for it to happen or waiting for it to go or get yeah. better yeah um really difficult <clears throat> situation um do you, ha- you know, when you had that initial attack, mm-hmm. how far away were you from dying? Say you couldn't get an ambulance or you couldn't get to hospital. So they- when I had the initial attack, it was actually, I worked in Huddersfield for, for um, a recruitment company at the time. And luckily, um, my luckily my manager at the time, there was me and her in the office. Um, so she, I couldn't thank her enough. She rang the ambulance. The ambulance came up, fight, fl- fight flight upstairs. I don't even know how they got me down them stairs. I can't even remember. Yeah. Um, but they came really, really quickly, and they were great in the hospital as well. So that's the that's the thing. That's the main fear. And my worry is that if you at a place where because we were thinking about going away to um, like you know, if you go to Cape Verde, I go to these islands that don't have a hospital nearby. I always think to myself, what if I love I love going to places where there's a hospital nearby, and that's really yeah. sad. Yeah. I... <laughs> But I, most people choose like you know if there's 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 nothing there and you're in a Caribbean and you've got nice things. Mine is you know literally I need a hospital or doctors nearby. Yeah, just in case. I could totally relate to that. We've had to do that so many times, and it's you know oh we can't go somewhere that exotic because there's not a hospital. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, it's peace of mind as well. Yeah, you know, definitely. You know, even in Mauritius, <laughs> and ended up in the hospital there, um, with an eye injury. You know, and you, you just think, yeah. And that would happen, so yeah. you've got to... <laughs> Definitely for me, <laughs> on my kids. So for me, yeah. And speaking of your kids, um, your son, Louis, has autism? Theo. Yes. Sorry, sorry, Theo. He's Theo, Louis, yeah. Louis is your husband. Louis is my husband, yeah. yeah. Do you have an idea for a podcast in your head? If so, we can record, produce, and promote that podcast to bring it to life. 
Contact us today to find out how. Um, how did you discover that he had autism? So from when he was a baby, so he was breech and obviously, I do often wonder the whole thing going back to his traumatic birth or things that happened, whether this, I don't know whether it's anything to do with it. I'm not, you know, scientifically, you know, experienced to, to think this, but when he was younger, um, he, they, I knew there was something. As a mum, you know your children, don't you? You have a gut feeling of there's something just not quite right with him and I didn't know what it was. Um, and he just used to cry all the time um, and he was very, very clingy. He had a lot of issues when he was a baby. He he was in and out of hospital, you know, every every other week um, with various things. He had really bad stomach problems, digestion, he wouldn't eat. Um, I couldn't feed him any food without him um, like vomiting. He would touch the back of his throat and, he'd, and he, he wouldn't eat. Um, so for... For a while, I knew that there was something not quite right with him. He went to nursery, he had a glue ear, and he had he couldn't really hear, so he was very loud. He didn't really... It took him a lot longer to speak as well um, or to communicate and say things. He just used to cry majority of the time. Um, and then it wasn't until he le- left nursery. Nursery used to say that he was really disruptive and he was naughty, he didn't listen, and he wouldn't sit still. And then um, it was actually a teacher in his primary school when he went into the first year. Um, she she had a child that had who was autistic, and she said to me, she reached out to me and said to me, Gee, "I don't want to offend you or anything." She said, "But have you ever thought that there's something not quite right with Theo?" And it was like music to my ears when she said that because I thought, you know, thank God somebody else sees what I see. And then from then onwards, I felt like I could reach out for some more, more support and help and to try and get his diagnosis to help him. Yeah. And what were his initial signs? Do you know what? I, I think a lot of it is he's, he's, he's 100 mile an hour. Um, he just, he didn't have any eye contact with anybody. He didn't want to talk to anybody. He didn't communicate very well. His social skills weren't very good with other children. Um, he wouldn't, it, uh, there's nothing really specific. Okay. I think it's just if you know your child is acting a lot a little bit out of character or doing things, you know that that you. It's more of a, it was more of a gut. I think for me, yeah. Uh-huh. And then um, since his diagnosis, how has the journey been? Very difficult. Um, he he's been diagnosed with ADHD and autism now, so um, he's under CAMS, um, he's on melatonin tablets, which he has on a night time because he can't sleep without them. Okay. So if he didn't have them, um, he probably wouldn't go to sleep. Really? Yes. Um, because, Did you know that was a symptom? Yeah, yeah, melatonin. I think it's something to do with the lack of melatonin, how we all have melatonin, and I think he hasn't got enough melatonin in his brain. Because it calms you down, doesn't it? It, it does, it, yeah. Yeah, so he's helping you get your tan, your skin tone, is that right? I think so, yeah, I think, yeah. Um, but he's just, um, he, he's, he was put on ADHD medication. Um, and it really dampened him down. It's good for some kids, but I think for Theo, we probably didn't get the right door. Okay. We didn't stay on it long enough. He's not a great eater as it as it is. Um, he hates sitting down at meal times. He says to me, "It's a nightmare trying to feed him because he says that it's boring sitting down to eat." So he will eat his tea, but while he's walking around and singing and flapping like a bird, or boring sometimes actually. Just yeah. yeah, you just can't. Can't get him to sit. He'll do his school. Sh- he'll get dressed for school, but you'll go in and then he'll be putting one sock on and then start doing something totally irrelevant that's not what you meant to do. So you've got to prompt him all the time. Uh, Probably like most kids. But, yeah, true. But it, it's hard work. It's tough. And I think for Theo, because he doesn't get the sleep, um, it affects as a massive impact on the day at school the next day because he's too tired. You know it yourself. Oh yeah. Like yeah. when you, it you must be exhausting for him, especially oh, when he's growing. Mm. Um, so he finds it really difficult, and then the social aspect of things. He he's um, he's very very overwhelmed all the time. He's very overstimulated all the time as well. Um, nothing can tire him out. He literally goes till he till he flops. If that can be a good thing as well. No, no. levels. Yeah, but... definitely. But he's got far too much energy for me. <laughs> Um, and I just look at him. Sometimes I do laugh when we all sit down and I'm trying to have a meal and Theo is just <laughs> running around the table being crazy or trying to do a headstand or do something. Um, but then that, that side of things, you can't take him out for meals or, you know, because he won't sit and eat meals. So it's um, it must all have an effect on you as well. The social aspect of things, yeah. It's like it's the things like, you know, like Christmas and family meals and things like that. You, 
you can't really do because Theo's the one that wants it still. It's boring and then it becomes more stressful and you take the enjoyment out of it and you think, what is the point? So. But I guess, you know, not everyone conforms to what's expected to be normal you know no yeah I think a lot of it it's I think it's the, for me my family are very old-fashioned so they think that you know children should sit down and eat and you know it's it's that kind of thing and and I think a lot of it with the diagnosis some people understand the diagnosis of autism and understand what that actually looks like or what it is every child's very very different every child's needs very different um and it's how you manage that so Theo works with constructive constructive feedback so rather than there's no point shouting and tell him he's 100 miles an hour in his head and if you're shouting things at him he's just can't cope um and with Theo we've got a plan um so you can't just if anything changes on the day he could have a massive meltdown he's got to plan future events we've got to know um what's happening from the from the minute of the beginning of the day to the end of the day he doesn't have any sense of time so when's morning when's night which is a nightmare in the summer because I've put a blackout blind to say it's bedtime. Yes, yes. So he's like, it's not bedtime, it's still it's still sunny. I'm like, no, it's bedtime. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. You probably still face that stigma from some people saying that there's no such thing and it's just bad behaviour. The, yeah, there's a few people that, I've, you know, over the years have they've said it's just label. People like to label a label a child. But uh, I disagree. I think, um, yeah. And do, you, do you find it helpful having that label so you can manage the situation? Do you know what? I, I thought at the time people used to say, some people used to say to me, you know, if you get him labelled, what is that going to do? What's that going to achieve? Actually, it doesn't achieve anything. All it does is it raises that awareness and then you can understand and learn more about what it is that he needs to support him. So as a as a mum, I I am constantly trying to put think of new ways to implement to how to get the best out of him to help him with school to help him with coping with just life in general, um, and preparing him. And if I know a way of how an autistic brain works or ADHD and some of the things that I've learned over the years that I've seen him do, I can then teach myself and train myself and actually explain and understand why he's doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it might be that because I because he's not very good at communicating he doesn't understand and he's only young must be so hard so yeah it's trying to read his mind all the time it's like a ticking time bomb waiting for it to go off or what's going to happen next bless you and what's the biggest challenge you faced um probably um probably just the daily th of, uh, for Theo it's um he gets overwhelmed with um too much too much going on. So Christmas is always a nightmare. His birthdays are a nightmare. Everything that leads up to an event or something that's going to happen, we have to prepare Theo with social stories and plan and tell him what it's going to be like. Otherwise, his anxiety um, and he won't go to school. Um, if you're rushing him and shouting him to try and get him to school, it just, it just doesn't work. So it, all the time I'm, try, I'm learning new things about him mm. and trying to educate myself on what can I do in this situation? What do other parents do? And there's just... Yes, there's just not enough support out there. Yeah, support for you as well, because you're going through it emotionally as well. You're yeah. taking on that burden. Oh, that burden's the wrong word. Yeah, but it is hard because you just think that, you know, there's things that you, you suppose with your, your husband, we're married, we don't have much free time and yeah. um, freedom or, you know, and it's getting, you know, to go out and to do nice things. We've always got to think in the back of our mind, like, okay, well, how would Theo be in this situation? Is it good? I'd love him to experience it, but is it going to be worth it? Mm. Um, so there's a lot of things that we have to not do because we think it's just not worth putting Theo through that. Yeah, and how does his sister Ava cope with that? Um, she finds it really difficult because she thinks that we'll go places and then um, she'll say, oh, it's really unfair or, you know, um, and Theo needs a lot more support. So then um, sometimes I do try and make and take time out with me and her um, to be able to make sure that I'm supporting her as well. Because yeah, well, she have to learn to understand how her brother reacts differently to things too. I think it's hard. She does, but I think it's hard with siblings, isn't it? And especially at that age, the teenager age. She's like, well, he's just annoying, and I just hate him. <laughs> so I'm like, true. Oh god. <laughs> um. So she's she's not as understanding, but I, I think as in time when she gets older, when she learns about it a little bit more and understands why he does things, we're still learning now with him. Yeah. Um, and you know, we we don't know everything. And we can't answer why he does these things or whatever. So, so yeah, it's a tough one. 
What would you say to anyone who perhaps suspects that their son or daughter has autism and what they can do and how to manage it? <clears throat> um, the best thing to do, I mean, a diagnosis is does, is does not solve anything. I think at the end of the day, it just helps you understand and accept that actually your child is maybe going through something that you need to support them a little bit more with um, and understand why they're doing that and then make sure you put things in place. So I would definitely reach out to um, to CAMS or you can do a self-diagnosis now um, and try just try and put the next things in, in process in place. We've just got the uh, educational healthcare plan put in place. So my concern was that he was going to go through primary and actually how is he going to cope in secondary? Yeah. Um, and without his educational healthcare plan um, and put in place, I could not guarantee that the support was going to be there for him. So now we've got that, I feel that as soon as you know, the earlier you do it, the better. Mm -hmm. um, because then you can plan and you know that that the help's going to be there for you if you need the help. You and do you support. fight for that? You do. I, I did it. Took me three years to get Theo's educational health care plan. Yes. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the sooner you know, the better. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can do it at any point, but obviously, you know, I think the process takes so long and you've got to jump through a lot of evidence and hoops and you've got to work with the school. So it's a lengthy process. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. Okay. Um, another thing that you've been through, that <laughs> skin cancer. Yes. Um, <laughs> were you a prolific sunbather before? That? No, I mean, to be honest, um, a lot of people do ask me this question because um, I suppose, I don't know, some people maybe think that you, to be able to get skin cancer, you have to go on the sunbeds or you have to be a sun worshipper. I wasn't um, I wasn't in the, going on the sunbeds any more than anyone else. I did, I did use the sunbeds when I was younger, um, but not any more than currently. I know a lot of people that use them a lot more than what I do and um, sunbathing side of things on holiday... I didn't sunbathe any more than what anybody else would really mm -hmm. on holiday. Yeah, and how did you discover? Do how did you discover you had skin cancer? So, I'd come back from Cuba actually, uh, with one of my work colleagues, and when I was there, um, I had a small mole which was on my stomach, um, and I was putting sun lotion on while I was there, and then I felt like it was a little bit stingy and it hurt, and I thought, oh, why is why is that stinging? So when I came back, I noticed that it changed and it had gone like a black with a blue, pearly blue colour on top of it. And I thought, right. that looks a bit weird. So, thankfully, I went and took myself to, um, it was Piper House, I think, at uh, Darlington, but... yeah. And there was a doctor there. I walked in and he looked at it and he was like, can you come back this afternoon? We need to take it out. So I was like, okay, I was not expecting that. So then went away, came back and then cut it out and then said to me, um, the results will be with you soon. And I can actually remember, I wasn't worried at the time because I didn't even know what skin cancer was. I didn't know what the the results were. I didn't know, you know, I didn't even know the, like how severe skin cancer was. Mm. How old were um, you at the time? 20, 22. It's young. 22, yeah. yeah. And, I'm, and I, was, I was starting a new job and um, the, the rang me, the doctor rang me just as I was about to go into um, the place of work. And he said, um, we need you to come in and see us. We need to talk to you. And I said... Can you not just tell me on the phone now? I've, I've got a I've got a new job. I'm starting a new job today. And we're like, no, you need you to come in. So then instantly I brought down the car crying. I thought, oh, like this is going to be really bad. Um, went with my dad, went to the clinic, um, and he said you've got um, melanoma, which is a the most deadly form um, of skin cancer. Um, we need to take the skin from around the outside of where it is to see whether it's spread. Because um, it spreads, before it goes down, it spreads across. Okay. So I had some more skin removed. Um, and then they looked at some other moles and took a few other other moles, biopsies and things like that. That was probably, um, then the, the make you wait two weeks, which was the longest two weeks of your entire life. Um, because you're just waiting around to see whether it's spread. Mm -hmm. And your um, goes into overdrive during the Yeah, time. yeah, it was awful. Yeah. Um, so I had it removed. And then um, luckily, it only got to the second layer of my skin. Um, so it hadn't gone down into lymph nodes and things like that otherwise. So then I got referred to a cancer nurse for five years and I continued with her for five years after that. Did you need any further treatment? No, just checking every, every for the for five years and making sure that nothing had grown back. Um, I had a few more moles removed during that time just to make sure that they were all okay. Um, but yeah, apart from that, it was 
It's okay. Yeah. And do you sunbathe now? <laughs> no. No. Okay. I go on holiday. Um, the kids absolutely hate it because I have, they look like white snowmen because <laughs> they wear factor 50, especially Ava. I yeah. walk around following them around, putting sun lotion on them. Uh, I wear factor 50. The kids wear factor 50. And um, I do, I would never go near a sunbed ever again. Um, because I just think that there's friends that do use sunbeds and my brother goes on and I still tell him. But I think when you're doing it, you, I, and I was the same, you never, ever think that it's going to happen to you. Yeah, of course. I know. Mm-hmm. And do you think maybe some people just have bodies where it's never going to affect them? Yeah. But yeah. I think, yeah, I think every, my skin cancer nurse told me that everybody's got some kind of form of, of cancer or something in them. Okay. But it's it's to know. <laughs> well, but that's what she said. I don't know whether it's true. Um, but it takes um, it takes something significant to to make it form or trigger it to trigger it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And if anyone yeah. is perhaps suspecting that they've got a dodgy mold, probably a better way of putting that. Twenty percent get a check. Yeah. What what size? You mentioned yours went darker. So any, I would get. I would say we recommend any mold that you have that you have and it's changed shape. Um, or change colour or change texture. Texture. It doesn't even have to be a mole. Mm-hmm. Um, it can be any kind of change in your skin. Like blemish. Yes, Thank blemish you. or anything. Yeah, just get it checked because um, I can remember my cancer nurse saying to me that breast cancer, and no disrespect, breast cancer is, is awful, but breast cancer, can, skin cancer, melanoma, is probably worse than having breast cancer. Reason being is because when you have breast cancer, they can remove your, your, your breast. Yeah, but they can't remove your skin. You cannot, yeah, once it goes in past your skin and goes into your internal organs and everything else and your, and your lymph nodes, they can take away so many lymph nodes, but then after that, there's n- there's no other option. And chemo, I think, I don't think it actually works on. And really, just recently, yeah, um, a few, uh, one of my friends, dad's friends died from, from melanoma as well. So there's two people. Yeah. Yeah, obviously, you, sorry, I said you can't remove your skin. You can remove the areas of skin, but oh, I suppose it's everywhere. Yeah. Then, yeah. I mean, I've had a few moles removed mm-hmm. as well, and I'm so moly. You yeah. Know, and yeah, it's hard, isn't it? To yeah. Try and keep an eye on because I've got so many mm-hmm. everywhere. And then I got quite a few changed while I was pregnant, but apparently that happens. It does. Yeah. And then you just think, oh, God, I don't want to bother them again. This yeah. one's changed a little bit, and that one's changed a little yeah. bit. Then I would be there every week. So, there, yeah, there is that. me. I'm still there every week. <laughs> yeah. Well, I go every week, but then Ava, my daughter, she's 13, she's got a mole on her arm. And I have been to the doctors with her three times now because it just didn't look right. Mm-hmm. And she's like, "You're not, we're not removing it, mum. And I'm like, well, it's coming out if it needs to come out. And um, But the doctors have said it's fine. It's very rare for a child to have skin cancer. Okay. Um, so but anything like that, yeah. If you're unsure, just get it checked. Yeah, really good advice. Thank you for sharing all your medical. That's all right. <laughs> so with a long list. <laughs> I know, that's you. Um, on, we're now on to our regular feature okay. um, where we ask 10 questions and you rate yourself 1 to 10, 1 be the worst, 10 be the best at them. How good looking are you, Jim? Well, I'd probably say a 4. Or a 4 or 5. <laughs> so if you spend, it depends how I'm feeling on the day. <laughs> Too harsh. How funny are you? Um... I probably laugh at myself more than anyone else laughs at me, but I'd probably say a five. Cooking? You'd be really harsh, by the way. I oh, know. Well, um, cooking, I'd like to cook. I like cooking. I enjoy cooking. I just don't have the time to do it. So I'd probably say seven. Okay. Singing? Definitely zero. I cannot sing. I'm trying to think. Because we were at school together. I'm trying to think if I ever heard you sing. Back no, school. definitely not. No. No. I don't think. I, well, I like to I like to sing in the car, but my husband would be like, he's like a squealing cat, so definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> do you drink much these days? Oh, well, I try not to, but yes, I do like a glass of wine. Yeah, and have you got good tolerance? Uh, no. So I um, probably, after a few glasses, it got to my head. So yeah, I'm a bit of a lightweight, but cheap it. Actually, what, that's one thing. I had to cut out sulfites. I had a really bad sulfite allergy. And then if I'd had sulfites and wheat, that seemed to trigger an even worse reaction. Wow. So, yeah, so unfortunately, I, there's not much alcohol I can drink these Also, days. what do you drink when you do have a drink? It has to be quite uh, vanilla, like uh, gin and tonic. Yeah, you know, oh, I fancy okay. cocktails could have all sorts yeah. of wine. There's, yeah. I can get sulfite-free organic wine. Which to me, it tastes great because I can't have any of the wine. Yeah. I really miss wine. Well, I used say, yeah, ooh. I'd hate that. Yeah, now I've got used to it. Mm-hmm. And because the option is like a boring gin and tonic, which sometimes it's all right, I tend not to drink. bother to have it. Yeah, yeah because yeah. it would be like the joy of a nice glass of wine with a meal. Yeah. A spirit in a meal. It doesn't seem to doesn't go, does it? No. Yeah. yeah. Um, parenting skills. 
Oh, well, if you ask my daughter, <laughs> that's not too sure what she'd say. Um, I like to think that I'm a good parent. I spend a lot of time with my kids and they're always, they always come first and everything. So I would, I'm going to say I give myself a nine. Brilliant. Friend. I would say I'm a very, very loyal. So I would say a nine as well. Um, intelligence. Mm. <laughs> not too sure I've got intelligence. Um, I'd probably say an eight. Brilliant. Kindness. Definitely a 10. Oh, it's lovely. Always put people first before myself. Yeah, lovely. And Gemma, how good at sex are you? Well, you know, I did cringe when you put this on the on the message at the end. Uh, I think it depends on how many glasses of wine I've had. <laughs> I asked Louis, does it improve with more glasses of wine? Possibly, yeah. Uh, there's the it's laugh probably an scale, isn't it? Yeah. The bell curve. But then yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Gemma. That's okay.